Welcome back to the Chasing Common Ground podcast. And if you are tuning into this on YouTube or watching video on Substack, I've got a different background. I'm actually not doing the typical Zoom background that I normally do. So make sure to subscribe to check out what it looks like. It's almost like a between two ferns situation I got going on here. <laughs> So I am honestly just super pumped to have Ryan Patrick joining me on the show today. I'm going to give some backstory as to what makes this especially special. And it is honestly like I can remember that I started following you probably like four to five years ago. And the style of the delivery of your content resonated with me. It, It was in a high level brought down to a style that could appeal to more people like it's like you were taking complicated concepts and making it accessible to a broader audience and as I learned more about some of the things that you're offering I was like you know this would be perfect to kind of like put in front of more eyes especially like if I have some Canadians that have never heard of you So yeah, before we dive too much further, I'd love it if you could give my audience a little bit of a description of who you are and kind of what you do. Yeah, my name is Ryan Patrick. I run a personal training business, strength and conditioning business in Erlinger, Kentucky, which is just a little bit outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. I've been doing that. Let's see. uh, We started in 2010. So this is into my 15th year. And we've had a lot of iterations of the business, what it looks like, group, larger group models, personal training. And these days we work primarily with athletes. So we do have a pretty uh, well-tenured stable of adult clients. Specifically, we just work right now in a semi-private training. So more specific needs, more individual attention. And that model suited us really well. But yeah, that's kind of the the quick and dirty. And to add on to some of the the things that I've seen within our time connected on Instagram is there was a while back, like probably during the pandemic, you did this epic hype video with like some of your football athletes that has lived rent free in my mind ever since, just because it was so well done. And it was kind of like sort of what I got out of it was so much of like leading by example and kind of like not just talking about it, but being about it. And Mm -hmm. it was that spark of something that I needed to see in the social media space at that time. It was like, okay, it's less about arguing about whether we do exercise this way or that way. And it's more about implementing the thing that is the most effective way to get the outcome that we want, which will coincide with some of the stuff you're up to with some of your online programs. So Mm -hmm. With that said, can you deconstruct what your online program is, what you're offering, and who you're working with specifically? Yeah. So I'm going to have to back that. I, I got to see if I can even remember that video that you're talking about. But I think I'll start there actually to kind of unpack what it is we're doing now and kind of where we're going. And so really from like 2000, I don't know, 14, 15 or so through pretty much the end of 2019, my personal focus was on strength sports. So I power lifted, I did some strongman, I did something known as the tactical strength challenge, which kind of comes out of the, the strong first community for those of you who are into kettlebells at the, the kind of forefront of where my focus was. Now, in the back of my mind, I always enjoyed training athletes. I found that when they had a goal that was worth pursuing, that their attention, intention, was just a much higher level, more so than somebody who wanted to lose fat. And that's not saying anything's wrong with people who want to improve their body composition. I just, we tended to get a lot of clients who had a really hard time connecting to a bigger why. And so we kind of found our gen pop in this place where we were just, we were doing these strength sports because it gave them something to really pursue. And it was a lot of fun, but Around the end of 2019, things just started to take a toll on my body. So I had the tactical strength challenge, was very successful with that, and then rolled into another training phase in preparation for a powerlifting meet. And I must have herniated a disc in my back because I had some really serious sciatica, like to the point where it hurt to sit down, it hurt to drive my car. 
it, it pretty much hurt just day to day and I, and I couldn't walk that well. So got it better. Of course, at that time we went into the pandemic and right before then I got my first NFL athlete. So his girlfriend at the time actually reached out. She was looking for something to train. She was an athlete herself in college. And she's like, you know, a lot of the other wives and girlfriends, they're doing Pilates and other stuff. And she's like, I want to train. So we started working with her, got a hold of her boyfriend. And that was my first NFL athlete. We were having a pretty successful time with him. When everything shut down, um, there were just a stable of guys who were in his draft class who had nowhere to go. And so right away, I went from uh, never working with a professional athlete to having roughly like 12 of them in my garage at a time, which was just crazy. And one of the first things that occurred to me was my background in strength sports really impacted my athleticism negatively. I couldn't move very well. I couldn't demonstrate. There was just a lot of complications trying to execute this stuff. I had the knowledge to talk to these guys. I had a lot of knowledge in terms of what I wanted to have these guys do, but just really felt like I was insufficient in demonstrating this. I still kind of wrestle with this idea of how much of this do I actually need to be able to do versus how much do I actually need to be able to coach? And I think there's probably a sweet spot. And I'm not saying any coaches that can't do these movements should be banned from coaching athletes or anything like that. Cause I don't want to put any kind of gatekeeping on this, but for me, it was really important to be able to show these guys. And so that kind of spurred me into changing my own training focus and really getting into speed training. And one of the things I, I quickly realized was that there just wasn't a lot of education out there for this, meaning there are speed coaches and they're pretty well recognized at this point, but there wasn't any formal education. And so it kind of led me to this place of, you know, we have to get back to some of the biomechanical and physiologic foundations of what we're, what we're talking about when we're actually coaching these athletes. And so this has been a, a pretty intense area of study for me, and it's still evolving. And in many ways, <clears throat> there are guys who are experts in uh, breaking and deceleration and eccentric muscle contractions. There are guys who are experts in, in linear speed. There are guys who talk about multidirectional speed. And so it was trying to stitch a lot of this together and create a framework for myself that was really easy to implement, easy to coach, and effective at the same time, but was really respectful of what I feel like are important scientific foundations that sometimes just get overlooked. And I think speed is one of those areas of the industry where it can get very gimmicky, very quick, and people will try to blindly apply some of this knowledge without an understanding of when they should use it, what it's actually doing, who it's appropriate for and in what circumstances it's appropriate for that person. And so, you know, that kind of brought me to a place where I realized I had to coach my team as I was learning as well. And as I was building this kind of mental model out in my head. And so now we're known, we're known for speed. I mean, we talk about speed. It's part of our language of what we do when we communicate with our athletes. It's, it's uh, still an area that I'm, you know, very interested in and is continuing to evolve. And I feel like is in its relative infancy in terms of what we know, because there's still so many unknowns, but that's brought me to this place of my online mentorship, which is really about building fast athletes faster. There is a blend of speed, power, and strength, and just giving people not all the knowledge. I don't want to overwhelm people with uh, an education course. The purpose of what I'm doing isn't to try to create a master's level background in the scientific foundations, but to actually build a bridge from what we know about these scientific foundations, what things are actually impactful and how we can influence them from a training standpoint. And so we talk about assessing them and being able to measure what matters and identify the things that are most important, how to understand and interpret what we're actually measuring and then how to influence it through training. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot that I can branch off from there. And even like leading up to this interview, been listening to your show on and off throughout the last few years, I think. I've li listened to your episode with Kyle Dobbs, with Dean Guido or Guido, depending what day it is. I've listened to your episode with Zach Couples. I was listening to your episode, I think it was with Jim Laird this morning. 
And what I like about it is you actually use the words common ground, which is great because that's what I've called this show. It's chasing common ground. And it's your ability to take sort of perspectives from all realms of the industry, whether it be someone who's focused on strength, whether it's somebody who's really diving down the rabbit hole with jujitsu or someone who is doing some of the more what can be seen as like low resistance work, but more about like positioning of ribcage pelvis, stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. you're able to bring all of this stuff together to make it more executable for the end user, rather than it being something that's on the top shelf out of reach for the majority of the population. Because like lately I've been reflecting on like, what are the realities of like our world and like I looked at statistics and I think most of these were pulled from like 2020 or so it was basically mm -hmm. that 75.8% of Americans do not meet the minimum activity standards and then 84% of Canadians do not meet the minimum activity standards and then I was like well what could be like the root cause of that and I think like what what is it that drives me back to different physical activities? Because I've done, I've been a spin instructor. I've done just some heavy lifting. I haven't been a power lifter, but I've enjoyed a heavy trap lift from time to time. Um, and now I'm enjoying jujitsu. And it's just that sort of like camaraderie element, the ability to be able to handle losing, but know how to progress in order to eventually get to a win. Like, there's a lot of instances where if you can't see how you can get from A to B, you can get discouraged. And then I get mm -hmm. thinking about all the team sports and just kids who have played a team sport, they don't, but they only played it for two years. So then I was looking at the cost per year per kid per sport and how it can fluctuate and how you can get more out of it. So for example, some of the numbers that I came out of, and these are rough numbers, but they're easily rationalized. For soccer, it was looking like it was about 1,000 to 2,000 per season per kid. And then on the extreme end, which was enlightening, because it's almost like this is a default for me, but it was hockey, was in the range of 7,000 to 10,000 per kid. And I thought about it more and I was like, well, it's rational that it's actually going to be closer to the 10,000 for Canadian kid versus an American kid. Because in Canada, just our major cities, our towns are all further apart. So those parents are paying more for mileage. They're more likely to pay for a hotel for different tournaments and stuff. And then I was thinking like, okay, so from like a investment, like a taking the emotion out of it perspective, if you're a parent getting your kid into a sport and you're paying like 10 to 20 to 30,000. If you have multiple kids per year for that sport and you have no clear path to get them from a to B, like how discouraging is that? Not only for the parent, but also for the kid who never gets to become explosive on the ice, who never gets to be able to move their body in a way that's practical for their sport because just there's a lot of kids who don't have a mind muscle connection there's a lot of kids who feel awkward they feel discouraged the parents feel discouraged and as a result what happens is this compounding effect of they reach their adulthood and then 84 percent of canadians don't meet the minimum physical activity standards and so mm -hmm. that's where i felt most inspired to bring you on to talk about what you're offering because I can see it really closing that gap because there's just such a disparity in activity levels. And when I think about what helps people like in the back of their mind as they reach adulthood is they can reflect on a positive experience in sport. Like for me, I played soccer for like probably at least a decade and I didn't always win, but I had, I had access to different drills that could help me with my speed I had access to a weight room where if I wanted to get stronger, I could. These elements were at my disposal. And then I think of like, what would I do like if I had access to that much better coaching at a level to which I could like comprehend and like that would be a game changer. Because like, I think of how while I was athletic, 
I wasn't necessarily like the best athlete. And mm -hmm. as a kid, how cool would that feel to level things up? And even just from a coaching perspective, because I've been in the industry long enough to see a lot of people start their careers and finish their careers. Because it's like, mm -hmm. it's inspiring to see somebody start because you can relate. And it's like, yeah, I understand this. And it's inspiring to see when they're an athlete training other athletes. Like I've seen some top athletes go out and train other athletes. But then they might end up being like a real estate agent or something, or they might just end up selling insurance and they're still mm -hmm. athletic, but they're not able to pass that on to the youth or perhaps there's just something that's missing where they weren't able to make it as sustainable as they needed to for their own life needs just to continue on this tangent, something that has been really helpful for me when I'm like looking at all these numbers and data and trying to understand what's the best like path is like taking the emotion away from it and just looking at like the facts. And this kind of aligns with one of your recent posts that you did, physics being kind of like mm -hmm. physics is the reality, you can't deny physics. And mm -hmm. so I think about your ability to close that gap for people who are in a sport to enable them to either as a coach continue to build their athlete roster because more athletes are staying in the sport or as an athlete continue to stay in the sport yeah. so that they could become future coaches so that they could pass that on to their kids there's a lot of our friends in the industry who are already parents who or who are becoming parents. A uh, huge motivation for them is to be able to not just talk about it, but be about it. But if they do not have the foundation skill set in place to keep that up after they turn 30 and as they approach 40 or even past 40, then it just becomes sort of like this, this thought, this dream, this like, well, I used to do this, but I can't do it anymore. So where a person might think, ah, it's just, I mean, it's just like a program. What can this do for me? Where I think about it is the difference in a person's quality of life to be able to sustain the use of their body in a way that can go fast, that can be strong, that can be explosive, and then to apply that to elements of their life that support their social needs that support their sense of purpose, to equip people to become future coaches, whether it just be for their kid's team, so that they can actually do the drills with the kid. Because if we look at it like objectively, there are a lot of teams out there where they'll need a coach for the kids, but the coach for the kids might not be able to demonstrate all the drills that the kids are doing, because that mm -hmm. coach doesn't necessarily have that skill. Or if you watch like probably a majority of teams out there where all the kids are going to the soccer field or all the kids are hitting the hockey rink. Not all the parents have the prerequisites to demonstrate all the things that the kids need to do. Most of the kids can go faster than the parents can. And this doesn't apply to everybody, but it applies to probably like the wider net of kid sports. With all that said, have you ever thought about it from the perspective of like the compound effect of like how a person's competency in something can dramatically impact their life like 20 to 30 years down the line? Or have you always kind of thought about it more in like the short term of just kind of getting the athlete to perform better within the next two years kind of thing? A little bit of both, man. There's so much to unpack here. And I think you know, one of the simple things that I want to identify is I wish there were more just recreational opportunities for young athletes, because too often it, it gets very competitive at a very young age. And obviously everyone in the fitness industry who's familiar with the long-term athletic development model, we're pleading for this uh, generation of athletes to come up where we recognize the need for just, um, a multitude of sports from the movement literacy that they can get. There's lost play and just going out there and being creative from a movement standpoint. And I think what happens, especially at younger ages, is you see a lot of kids become isolated and in some cases excluded from sport because it really does become about winning and not about developing and stuff. So that's a, 
<clears throat> societal challenge, I think that we're definitely up against. And of course, at older ages, there are opportunities for activities. Tons of people run marathons and do that. I've done the midlife crisis division at jujitsu tournaments. I try to stay active and relevant. Strength sports are pretty inviting for people, but team sports is, is always a team sports is always tough. I feel like any over 30 men's league is like, it just exists as a microaggression. So, <laughs> you know, there's just, uh, it's just tough, but one of the things that I always communicate to my parents and athletes when they do come in is um, I work best with kids who are on a path. Most of the time people associate that with, I want to get ready for college. And we have a lot of athletes who are gifted enough to make that jump. A lot of kids who maybe will, will not choose that. But for me, the path is really one of three things. One it's the kids who are going to college and they want to just optimize their physical performance for that. Plain and simple. Two, we've got a lot of ACL return to play athletes. So we're looking at those athletes as, hey, I don't know if I'm going to go to college or not, but I've only got four years in high school and an ACL is taking one away. I want to come back. I want to do this. I want to enjoy it. And I also want to have longevity and not deal with any complications with my knee. So they're usually pretty locked in. And the third one is just, I would say maybe some of our average athletes where they go to a competitive high school, or maybe it's just a stretch for them to make the team and contribute for the team. And for them, that's really important. And I, I like those underdogs a lot because I feel in many ways that fitness can be a microcosm for just success in life, right? You put in work, you develop skills. You can't always control the outcome, but you can control what you're doing. And whether or not you're successful in that endeavor, you're going to learn a lot about yourself in terms of your ability to put the work in and understand and prepare to the best of your ability. So I find that to be really refreshing, but I caution some of the parents who are intense, you know, the, I have an elite 10 year old on a travel team that. I, I don't want this to, I don't want what we're doing to be punitive. I don't want it to be an obligation for these kids because they're going to have negative associations with physical fitness. And I think like there's so many positive things that can come from this, but if they're not in the right headspace, then this becomes, I think something that potentially dissuades them from activity as an adult. And it's too easy to be lazy as an adult. My son had soccer practice all throughout the fall, Thursday night. And it was probably one of my favorite times during the week because I had an hour and a half on this open field to run around and do sprints and all kinds of movement skills and conditioning. Every other parent was just standing around or sitting with a lawn chair. I can look around and tell who's getting enough physical activity and who's not. This is something that we need to do, but just culturally, I'm the crazy guy out there running around. And I remember being in high school, we had this guy who would come up to our fields and he would punt the soccer ball, it felt like, you know, 50,000 feet in the air and he would just sprint after it. And I'm like, dude, this dude's crazy. And then I kind of had this realization during one of my rest periods where I was, where I was like, I'm that dude, you know, mm -hmm. I'm him now. So, yeah. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think there's just a lot of challenges that we're up against. Certainly from the, the coaching standpoint, I, I try to be someone who doesn't throw a lot of shade I was actually going back and forth today about whether I should post a, a an Instagram post about one of the exercises I really hate. And I'm like, I don't really know if that's helping anybody or if it's just, you know, attention mongering with, you know, people putting a stake in the ground and, and coming to my side. But I do love great coaching. I do want to do things at a high level in my facility. And I, I try to be cautious not to poo-poo on what other people are doing, as long as it makes sense and it's not harmful. Because even if parents or coach, sport coaches are not the best at certain technical things, just giving the kids exposure and, and getting them active and moving is going to be far more important than, you know, who does the best sprint dynamic warm-up prep. So there's just a lot of considerations these days, I tend to speak to a lot of coaches who do work with these athletes. I think we have a really exciting opportunity to expose athletes to something that is really beneficial. But I think there's probably a number of kids out there who are getting overlooked for various reasons. I just want to make sure that I'm um, not 
discouraging anybody from being active. We do kind of have our wheelhouse, but I've had a few athletes come in who they're on the chess team or the bowling team, and that's not really physical activity, robotics even, but they come in, they just want to move better, look better. They're not really at the same level as our athletes, but for them, there's a lot of things we can do at training too. So I, I tend to not get as much of them. Parents aren't as willing to invest in, in a program like ours when they're not doing it for a sport, but I have had some of them. And I think there's probably an opportunity out there for a lot of those non-athlete kids to be reached who, who need some kind of exposure to what we do. Yeah. I mean, you spoke on a lot of things that once again, give me lots to talk about. First and foremost, I'm like that athlete that you just described. I'm very familiar with like that's, that's sort of basically my bread and butter is working with the kids who an aspect of fitness enhances their life. And then it's just about us discovering what it is that they enjoy the most and sometimes just about kind of doing a loop around the gym and hitting up all the machines, getting a good pump, having a good time, having good some good stories. And just like from my point of view, when I've seen a kid who is not active um, and then seen how their life outside of the gym has tr transformed as they become more active, it's night and day. Not only do things like their posture change and their fitness changes and their heart rate changes but their ability to handle challenges and handle adversity and think in a way that is beyond the immediate problem but kind of think in a broader perspective of like okay is this really a problem can i overcome this like they're not as anxious they don't overthink as much they don't get as nervous they don't shy away from new things they're willing to try more things they're often more socially active and my thought process here, and this is a very wholesome podcast, so I always think about like, how can I possibly help people in like a overarching way? But the thought process here is that the world isn't necessarily going to make it easier for like that underdog kid to be more active. And so mm -hmm. the more that we equip each other, our colleagues, future colleagues, general people who just happen to come upon podcasts, the more we equip them to kind of pe keep people in the game, whether it be like rec league basketball and just allowing them to reduce their chance of injury just because of more balanced programming or yeah. whether it be reducing the chance of heart disease. Like that's a big one. A lot of people don't even factor in the likelihood of them succumbing to one of those health risks that is not really detectable. Like when a person has problems with their blood pressure, they usually don't notice it until it's like, oh my gosh, I should have noticed this sooner. Like unless they're checking their blood pressure regularly, they're probably not kind of feeling it. Whereas if they're in a sport, even in a very amateur level, the likelihood of them having that crossroads is much less. Like when I've played on a rec league basketball team versus when I haven't, I just don't need to check my blood pressure as frequently because it's almost like intuitive. It's like if I can sprint across the basketball court and catch my breath real quick, I'm probably okay. And if I cannot, or if I am taking some time to recover, or if I'm just feeling like that was the toughest thing I've ever done in my life, then I probably need to be more regularly active, go on more walks, have more fiber, drink more water, stuff like that. But from the grand scheme of things, I think about it as if more people get exposure to a system or a mentor or a program that helps them to start turning those numbers in the other direction and also helps people get more return on their investment. Like from my point of view, if I was to spend $10,000 a year on something, it would be taking the emotions aside because I think it's important for kids to be in sport, to have fun. And I think also that if I was in a parent or guardian role and watching a kid in sport, I wouldn't be pushing them that they had to be the next like professional athlete or something like that. I would want them to have fun. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be concerned about whether they win or lose. But there would be a part of me that would want 
to set them up to get better each year or each month or each practice. And if I found that they were at a point where like I've seen teams get worse throughout the course of a season because their confidence plummets or like half the team gets Mm -hmm. injured or they have to forfeit games because they don't have enough players because they're morally just dejected. Like they just don't want to play anymore because they didn't have that baseline level of skill or there was just no hope. There was no light at the end of the tunnel for them. I have some of my general population clients in their 40s have talked to me about how they played sports for a bit, but because of an experience like that, they vowed to never play sports again because of this Mm -hmm. one season of (laughs) T-ball where Mm -hmm. they just didn't have the coordination to run around the bases fast. And then so they just had a bad experience and it stuck with them. And then they just didn't play sports after that, but they do this, they do that. Like they, maybe they do some zoom and they do the other thing, but it's just not, it's not helping them find community through activity. It's not helping them find purpose through activity. They're just kind of doing stuff just to do stuff with no end goal. And so Mm -hmm. that's where I start to feel like, like, wow, there really is something to unpack when it comes to the value of helping people learn how to move their bodies, but then helping people help people how to move their bodies because it has to be scalable. For an impact to be made, other people have to be empowered. It can't just, like, I can't just single-handedly change the world. You can't just single-handedly change the world. And everybody that both of us know combined across every interaction that we've had in our entire life, not even all those people single-handedly change the world. Each of us have to find ways to impact other people. So my thought process here is that hopefully as people listen to this, they start to think about like as they take on different endeavors, whether it be the programming that they do with their athletes or perhaps it's just the programming that they are experiencing themselves. Like the number of times that I have had other coaches take me through things where I've learned things, like whether it be the formal mentorships or I got to experience Lucy Hendricks' mindful movement stuff. And Mm -hmm. just to see her coaching style and her programming style helped me, even though I had plenty of knowledge myself, it helped me to see different ways that were like blind spots in my coaching with the clients that I worked with. And also just like things that I didn't know that I didn't know, like to be open to gaining new exposure to things. But the other thing that I'm aware of with coaches is sometimes they're like, oh yeah, no, that sounds like a good idea. Like it's, it's kind of like, they'll ask me what to do to get to this goal that they want to achieve. And I'll spell it out for them and like, yeah, I'll do it. And then they don't. So what I've learned is I almost have to like paint a picture of what it looks like for them to pursue something like your program. So let's say there's like a strength coach listening to this who actually does work with athletes and Mm -hmm. doesn't feel right about having that athlete stay the exact same year after year and not having measurable progress. Like how would they reach out to you? Like what does it look like for them to actually start with your program? I mean, I always just want to have a conversation with people just to see if it's the right fit. You know, there's there's a lot that goes into the mentorship and it's not something where I just want everyone to to sign up who it may or may not. Like I really wanted to impact people very positively. And so, you know, that would be kind of the first step is I'm pretty accessible and I'm open to having conversations. I, I've got a number of continuing education courses that I still haven't gone through. I've paid for them and they're just kind of in queue. And mm-hmm inevitably something else comes up every time I'm about to get to it. So I would want this to be at the forefront for somebody and and really talk about how to make impact. And so at the end of it, what I can tell you, the expectations that I have is that you'll have frameworks to actually assess program and uh, coach any kind of speed or athletic development. If you need a process, if you need something that's symptomatic and at the same time, holistic, covering all the needs of a specific athlete, then I think this would be a really good fit. Now, if you're working with, say, track athletes, I'm not your guy. I don't know a whole lot about block starts. I know enough, but I I don't consider myself really elite at that. If 
we're talking about dry land for swimmers. Yeah, we do some of that in my facility as well. But again, it's not an area that is high on my expertise. So I'm talking about team and field court sport athletes who are going to have multi-directional skill sets, who linear acceleration and max speed are important, who need to demonstrate power in different ways, like my baseball guys who have very high rotational power needs. A lot of that stuff falls into the bucket of, of what we're doing. But one of the things that comes to mind is I have seen some adults, you know, in their 40s, and fifties who, you know, they, you can tell they were not athletes as growing up, they didn't do anything athletic. And I feel like their, their lack of motor skills and dexterity is almost a liability. You know, they move around the gym and I'm like, Oh, like <laughs> kind of holding my breath as they go across the room, because it seems there's just a lack of confidence in their, in their movement. Not that they, you can just watch them just not be super efficient. And sometimes it's frightening. And, you know, there's probably a different approach approach with those clients versus some of my athletes. And I mean, ultimately what we want people to do when they get into fitness is um, get the dopamine response that we're looking for, right? It does so many things as far as influencing our desire for exercise and behavior modification. I think that's absolutely critical. So, you know, if you've got somebody who's never exercised and you annihilate them, like there's a, a good likelihood they're not coming back. And so yeah. depending on the athlete, you know, if it's maybe a kid who's just recreationally active or just looking to do something fun versus some of my serious, my more serious athletes, I'm always kind of trying to assess on the spectrum of like Richard Simmons to David Goggins, like who do I want to show up as today? Yeah. You know, and I think there's a sweet spot for every athlete, depending on what the skill is. But I think there's an element of the, the coaching stuff that's going to be embedded inside of this as well, because I have a, a unique approach. And ultimately, I think the knowledge and the implementation of what I'm giving you in the mentorship is, is kind of this idea of one mind, but many voices. I want you to have a foundation that is very structured, that is based on principles, and then your interpretation and application of it is going to vary. There are people who I'm not trying to clone myself. I don't need you to coach exactly like me, use exactly the same cues, but I want you to understand what you're trying to chase and allow your coaching mind and your coaching personality to kind of emerge within that knowledge in terms of how it's actually expressed. Mm -hmm. And I mean, everything there is solid and it just kind of makes sense. The thing that pops up in my head is a lot of the time people are just reluctant to even just reach out. So like mm. if they so much as just reached out to you on social media, you could start a conversation with them. And plus I'll also have the links to your websites and stuff in the show notes. So if people are listening to mm. this and they're like, okay, let's check this out. Let's learn more. That'll be in the links in the show notes. But just some of the things that I think about are like you illuminated it when you said you have a lot of the different stuff that you've started that you may not have completed totally. And mm -hmm. I am very similar. Like there's, there's a lot of things where I've watched every video. I went to every call and then there's some things where I've watched 40% of the videos and showed up to three of the calls. And it was just like, right place, right time kind of thing. Like sometimes my prioritization of what takes precedent takes me in one direction versus the other, but all things are valuable. So yeah. for people who may stumble across this episode, what I'm thinking of when it comes to people who would be really great for this program are like people who they're working with multiple athletes of one team where there is some kind of built-in community aspect to the people that they're working with and they're trying to move mm -hmm. the needle. For those athletes, there's a lot of businesses like brick and mortar businesses that are built off of like having contracts with certain clubs and stuff, like whether it be yeah. hockey clubs or now, I mean, Edmonton specifically, Edmonton, Alberta is becoming increasingly multicultural and we actually have a lot of cricket sports like i was going for a drive last mm -hmm. night and there is like an indoor cricket facility and i've never played cricket and it would be very similar to how popular pickleball is getting just like there's been mm -hmm. businesses built around different sports that may not have been popular in a certain community so the demographic is changing but with that, there's a lot of people that get like super excited uh, they want to get competitive, but then they hit this wall and then they never want to do it again. 
and they're missing some of those foundational skills. And then there's also people who are just like starting out in their career. They were an athlete themselves, but they're missing. There's like this gap where they're missing understanding how to pass that information on to another party. Yeah. Similar to things that I took away from my work with Lucy Hendricks is that like, I realized some of my, my blind spots. Like I'm, I'm not someone who thinks of myself as like, I know everything that there is to know or that I am the best, but if I don't collaborate with other people or if I don't work with other people, or if I don't hop on calls or jump in the DMS or do anything with anybody else, there's no way for me to know what's missing. If there's any coaches that are listening to the podcast right now that do actually work with athletes or know other people working with athletes, I would highly recommend that you just reach out to Ryan and learn more about whether you would be a right fit. Worst case scenario, you might not be the right fit, but you'll connect with mm -hmm. an awesome coach who could probably teach you a lot of things and other elements of communicating, leadership, and leading by example from a general perspective. But with that said, is there anything that you would like to leave the audience, just a general piece of advice or a closing statement to either set them up for success or get them thinking? Yeah, I'll build on what you were just talking about. So, you know, for me, ending up in this place with this mentorship started because I ultimately I just lack confidence with certain certain athletes that I was working with. I mean, I went from a handful or, you know, a decent stable of high school athletes to a professional who was probably the most athletic person that I'd ever seen. And it's like, how do you, how do you take somebody at that level to the next level? And there've been many situations where we have very green athletes underdeveloped who have extremely different needs. It's kind of like jujitsu, right? <laughs> So what game do you want to learn? But it was just knowing what to use and when to use it. And one of the things that I really try to impress throughout the mentorship is if you do feel stuck or you feel like maybe your coaching is getting stale or it's just not evolving as fast as you want and you're just kind of asking questions or, or feeling a little uncertainty, that's probably a good time to turn to something that can really expand your horizon. Kind of like to your point, I don't expect to fill every gap. What do they say? As the island of knowledge grows, so do the shores of ignorance. I'm constantly finding out there's so many rocks I haven't turned over. There's so many things that I just haven't explored at the depth that I would like, and I can't do it all at once. But Developing an athlete is a, it's one of the rare times we get, you know, just a, a really long runway to try to stack some, some fitness gains, you know, for, for all practical purposes, our adults will get a little bit stronger, but they're not, they're not doing the breadth of biomotor abilities that an athlete is. So it's very fun training. It can be complex at times, but it doesn't have to be complicated. And so that's the whole purpose is to simplify things, to kind of pull you out of your own headspace, give you some really practical ways to evaluate so you can get back to coaching and doing what you love. Mm -hmm. I love that. And before I forget, I just want to make sure that people know that if they want to dive a little bit deeper into this realm of fitness and learn from some of the conversations that you've had on your podcast, they mm -hmm. should check out the athletic performance podcast. What like to add some context, like a lot of the time I'll have a guest on and I'll be able to expose a person to about 30% of what that person has to offer. Like you, for example, yeah. my audience is just learning the tip of the iceberg with you. If they went and they listened to you talk to somebody who's helped you along the way or somebody that you've collaborated with or somebody whose knowledge that you value, they're going to understand just how much more value that you can provide or more of where you're coming from. Sometimes when people understand where we're coming from with things, they understand what's in it for them. For me, because I have such cool connections with people and I've been able to kind of see a lot of elements of what you have to offer, I already have that context. So if somebody is mm -hmm. thinking like, what is Chris getting at? What is he trying to share with us? Like always just dive deeper down the rabbit hole, support Ryan's podcast, give him the five stars, only give a rating if it is five stars, otherwise just breeze right past. 
With that said, I'll get you to stay on the call after I stop recording, but I just first and foremost want to thank you for taking time to be on the show itself. I always have fun chatting.